No one in my town remembers the past year. The morning I woke up to find my girlfriend Ava gone was like a splash of cold water to the face. At first, I thought she had left for an early shift at her job at the diner in downtown Eldridge, a sleepy little town that rarely saw anything more exciting than the annual fall fair. My phone was dead, which was odd because I could have sworn I plugged it in the night before. After rummaging through the drawers for a charger and giving it some juice, the date flashing on the screen made my heart stop. February 17th, 2024. That couldn't be right. Last night was February 16th, 2023. I stumbled out of bed, my heart racing as I dialed Ava's number, only to be greeted by the cold, impersonal tone of a disconnected line. The streets were just as confused and silent as I felt. Neighbors milled around, some in tears, others with a dazed look. I probably mirrored. It wasn't just Ava. Others were missing, too. We're doing everything we can, the sheriff assured everyone at the press conference, his eyes hollow, reflecting a year of questions with no answers. The police investigation stirred up more confusion than clarity. The only common thread was the last thing anyone could recall, a thick, unnerving fog that had swallowed the town whole. Hours turned into days, and with each passing moment, the weight of our collective amnesia pressed heavier. Then the visions started. At first, I thought they were nightmares, fragments of a subconscious trying to make sense of the nonsensical. But when I overheard Miss Henderson at the grocery store whispering about the shadows she'd seen in her dreams, I realized these weren't just personal demons. Others were all seeing them as well. In the days that followed, a makeshift support group formed. We were a band of the bereaved, each of us missing a piece of our lives, desperately searching for answers in a town that had none to give. We met in the back room of Eldridge's library, a space generally offered by the librarian Sarah, who was missing her husband and children. The meetings began as a way to share information, any leads that the police might have overlooked, but they quickly devolved into something much darker. It was during one of these gatherings, under the sterile buzz of fluorescent lights, that we first spoke of the visions. As the meetings unfolded, a shared narrative began to emerge, peace together from the fragments of those gathered in the dimly lit back room. It was a story that seemed too bizarre, too otherworldly, to be anything but the collective imaginings of a town gripped by loss and confusion. Yet the details were too consistent, too vivid, to dismiss outright. Every account converged on a single scene, a clearing in the woods enveloped in a fog so dense it felt alive, almost sentient. None of us remembered how we got there, yet the town's landscape hidden in plain sight and at the center of this clearing stood a large stone altar, ancient and worn, its origins lost to time. The memories were fragmented like shards of glass, reflecting pieces of a whole we couldn't quite grasp, 
But as we shared, the picture became clearer and a chilling realization settled over us. We had all been there, standing in a circle around the altar. Our hands joined in a pact we could scarcely comprehend. As the conversation spiraled deeper into the shared darkness of our memories, I found myself speaking without thought my voice, a stranger to my own ears. It was the only way, I heard myself say, the only way the fog would let the town go. The room fell into a hushed silence, the weight of my words hanging heavy in the air. Then from the back, the voice of my neighbor, Tom, cut through the quiet, Can you still taste them? Those four words, like a key turning in a lock, I didn't know existed. A floodgate of memories opened, and with it came a rush of visceral, undeniable truth. I was back there, in the clearing, the fog caressing my skin with cold fingers, and there, in my hands, was flesh, cooked human flesh. The horror of my realization was paralyzing, but even as my mind recoiled, my senses betrayed me. The taste, the texture, it was all there, horrifyingly vivid, as if watching through someone else's eyes, I saw myself take a bite, the act so barbaric, yet so achingly familiar, and then I saw it, the remnants of a tattoo on the shard skin. The revelation hit me like a truck, sending me spiraling into a nightmare I couldn't wake up from. The words, Ava Loves Hunter, inked on the shard forearm, were unmistakable. My stomach revolted as I hunched over, the contents of my gut splattering onto the cold library floor. My world didn't just spin, it capsized plunging me into a dark sea of guilt and disbelief. As I tried to catch my breath, gasping for air that suddenly felt too thick to breathe, Sarah's screams tore through the eerie silence of the library, her cries raw and filled with an agony that words couldn't possibly capture, echoed off the walls. She collapses into a heap on the floor, her body racked with sobs that seemed to shake the very foundation of the room. I ate them. My God, I ate my children. The girl I see on my commute never leaves the train. Now I know why. You ever find yourself having a crush for a complete stranger? I know it sounds random, but let me give you an example. Let's say you're in the grocery store or an amusement park or even on vacation on a cruise ship. And then there's that someone. They catch your eyes and there's half a chance you won't even talk to them. You didn't even know that this someone existed, but now that you're sharing this space for a short time, you still want to seem impressive or approachable, or maybe you're the type to try and make yourself cool and mysterious way more than you actually are. It may be a minute, it may be an hour, it might be weeks on end. But when that time's up, you will most likely never see them again. I'm a regular commuter on the subway, and have been for a few years now. When you're 17, living in a big city, and can't afford a car, you don't really have much of a choice. 
not like the traffic is worth the hassle of paying a couple hundred a month, along with gas, and insurance, and oil changes, and whatever crazy expenses. Said Carr wants to throw at you. My mom can barely afford her own bills, and she refuses to let me get a job, to even help out. Sweetie, you just worry about school and try to enjoy being a kid before you grow up. Trust me, it sucks most of the time. It was an annoying answer she gave me, but I guess it made some sense in a way. She was constantly overprotective of me like that, so with no car and no job, the subway has become a close friend of mine. My ride was always the seven train. It runs close to twenty-four hours a day. It was New York, so you can expect to see just. About everything, the eccentric street musicians working for tips, the crazy homeless men with bugs in their beards, exotic food carts with kebabs that might actually be alive, and so on. It was weird, but still oddly normal to me. There have been a few accidents with the trains. Which often left everyone uneasy about stepping foot in there, but with every tragedy, eventually we all have to move on. We fix what was broken and try to be better the next day. Fortunately, I was never on board when anything bad happened, but it did take some convincing to have Mom let me get back on the trains. I did have to go to school and get around the city to run errands because God knows my mom didn't have the time. But now that they've opened up to the public again, everything seems normal. As I was just settling back into my routine, I stepped onto the train, exhausted and just wanting to go home. That's when I met my someone. Well, I didn't technically meet her, not yet anyway. From first glance, she seemed like the most normal person there, until glancing turned into looking over every five minutes. It got to a point where I had to keep snapping myself back to reality, but I just couldn't help it. She was gorgeous. She had freckles scattered across her skin like stars, and her hair was pure ginger, just barely touching her shoulders. She had the most elegant curls too, the type where it seemed like it would take hours to perfect, and her eyes just the loveliest. Green hazel I've ever seen. Every time I'm on the train, which is almost every day, I would look over and there she was, and I don't exaggerate when I say every time. It doesn't matter if it was the weekend, or early in the morning, or late at night. She is always there. I've seen her for months, always in the back. She always wears the same mint green hoodie. She looked outside of the window, not even moving her head an inch away. She just st stared into nothing. What's weird is I've never seen her get off on any stop, but I just assumed that she lived farther than me. Every single day, she was there, and I wanted to say something. But I just couldn't. I never really had that much luck with girls. I just never seemed to be their type, and being rejected constantly didn't help boost my confidence at all. But I really felt this girl was special, even if I didn't really know her. 
So I had to try. I had to get her to see I existed. After school, I called my mom and asked if I could sleep over at my friend Todd's house for the weekend. He lives on the edge of Queens, so it wouldn't be that far of a trip. Plus, we could go to school together on Monday, and she wouldn't have to worry about dinner for the next few days. It took some convincing, but she finally caved. I told Todd I'd be over at his place later. His parents were out of town, so I could show up whenever I wanted, but I had to take care of some things first. It wasn't technically a lie. I was just hiding the intent behind my actions. The time had come to put my plan in motion. I spent the day running errands, hanging out with a few friends, and mentally prepping myself on what to say and how to say it. Later, I stepped on to my normal train and looked over near the back. And as usual, she was there, looking out the window. As usual, she was just as gorgeous as ever. I intentionally skipped my stop and waited for her to get off first so I could somehow approach her. I figured that if I do get horribly rejected, at least I won't have an audience. But her stop never came. More people got on and off, but she didn't move a muscle. It's like she wasn't even listening for her destination. Like she was perfectly sculpted statue. Embarrassingly, I waited for hours. I kid you not, it was already pretty late to begin with. I waited to the point where I dozed off a few times. I jolted up hoping she didn't get off while I was unconscious, but she was still there. It was like her body refused to move at all. I looked at the time and saw it was almost 2 a.m. I figured this was getting ridiculous and somehow talked myself into growing a pair and going up to her. At this point, there was only us and a few others on the train, all spread out. So I finally marched over and tapped her shoulder. Uh, hi, I'm Isaac. I've seen you a couple times on this train. We must have the same commute. I just wanted to... I stopped myself because something was off by the way she was looking at me. She seemed surprised that I snapped her out of her trance. She began to study me. The more she looked, the more scared and confused her face became. I could see her trembling. You shouldn't be able to see me. What? What are you? All of a sudden, my breath started to condensate, making the vapor completely visible. I felt normal only a few seconds ago, but now my body treated it like it was under 20 degrees. Her eyes widened as she turned her gaze to something behind me. Oh God, no, 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 no. I turned around to see a thin, lanky man in a black suit about 20 feet away with his back towards me. I thought he was just a normal man until his body started to contort itself. His arms became thinner and thinner as they slowly reached the floor and started to coil up like old rusty slinkies, his spine began to bend inward like he was folding in half, 
but could never break. His neck followed suit, with his arms stretching beyond what is humanly possible, his skin growing paler and paler until it reached a disgusting shade of gray. As he was stretching every part of his limbs like an endless supply of rubber, I saw his head slowly spin around several times until it locked on me. His eyes began to grow past his face until they were as big as his forehead. Then he smiled maliciously as if he was starving for something he'd been craving for a long time. His lips stretched out beyond his cheeks and moved upward past his head, exposing a horrific set of teeth. These teeth were not sharp and monstrous, quite the opposite, actually. They were tiny but jagged and curved, like how a kid would look before they had braces, but what made it unsettling was there were several rows, probably about six or seven, all stacked on top of e each other. The man started to convulse and foam started to drip from his eyes and I could hear my heart beating in my ears as he crept towards me. My legs kept in place. I was too petrified to move. As he got closer, I could hear an odd melody, very faint but noticeable. He was humming. I don't know, with his mouth wide open, but he was humming. I almost accepted that this was how I would die, eaten alive, or have my soul sucked out by some otherworldly creatures because I couldn't get a random girl out of my head for five minutes. I almost just let it happen. I saw no use in running, no way of escape until my thoughts were interrupted. Now arriving, Woodhaven Boulevard. The train had reached its stop, but I still felt like it was impossible for my body to move. It was like my muscles and nerves cut off the communication from my brain so they wouldn't be able to listen to my constant thoughts to run away. But I did have a little help. The girl grabbed my shirt and quickly pushed me toward the opening doors with an angry but protective tone. You need to get out of here. Now. B but that w What about... Get out! She pushed me out of the doors and I could barely catch my footing. I tripped and sat on the floor, watching the doors close and the train leaving with her and that thing on it. My breath was back to normal, but I was shaking. I had no idea what to say or do. I could barely fathom what just happened. So I just got up and walked to Todd's house. It was probably only about 30 minutes, but it felt like hours. I was exhausted not too long ago, but now I'm not even sure if I can fall asleep for a long time. I knocked on Todd's door and he looked like he had just rolled out of bed, but knowing him, He'd actually been up for hours. He had chips all over his shirt, and he was holding a controller while his TV was blasting from a couple rooms away. Hey, dude, where have you been? I've been waiting, like, all day. I was thinking you bailed on me. Are you okay? You look high. Are you high? If so, whatever you're on, is there enough for me? 
I didn't even realize how spaced out my face looked. To be honest, I could barely focus on whatever words came out of his mouth. What could I do? Tell him the truth? I don't even know what really happened. And even if I could somehow articulate it, he'd definitely think I'm insane. I'm not on anything, man. We can talk about it tomorrow. I just need some sleep, okay? Todd's smile dropped. He could clearly see I was not in the mood for any games. Yeah, sure, man. Come on in. I'm getting pretty tired, too. He patted my back as I got settled in his room. Sleeping over at Todd's was always nice. It's like a second home. The fridge is always stocked. It smells like autumn all the time. And the beds were the most comfortable thing I ever laid on. Todd kept his bunk bed that he shared with his brother before he left for college. So I always took the top bunk. I laid down with a thousand thoughts running through my head. What was that creature? Where did it come from? What did it want? Is that girl okay? What if she's dead? Did I just leave a girl to die when I could have done something? No, no. She pushed me out before I could even think, was any of it real? Then it's got to show up on the news or something. As my head got used to the coolness of the pillow, I found myself drifting off. At least this will bring me some peace for the night. The next morning, I looked all around on the news to see if there were any reports about a dead girl or a monster on the same train that night, but nothing came up. It must have been a realistic daydream or something. I'm more concerned about if she's okay, but there was really no way to find her. I knew nothing about her, where she lived, or even her name. I only knew what she looked like and where she always was. It was a huge leap of faith. I doubt she'd be anywhere near that train after what happened. But what else could I do? The next morning, Todd hounded me on why I knocked on his door looking like a disheveled mess. I obviously couldn't tell him anything until I had some answers, until I was sure it was real. I made my way back to the subway, not really knowing what to expect. I waited for what felt like eternity for this stupid train to arrive. I almost couldn't believe it when it finally stopped. I hesitated to step on, but then I remembered one of the biggest rules of New York. People are a type of traffic and you don't stop in the middle of moving traffic. As the doors closed, I looked around towards the back past dressy businessmen glued to their phones, cranky cat ladies who really need to find another hobby, and just straight-up crackheads mumbling strange nothings. And there she was, in her same spot, in her same routine, like the previous night. Never happened. She wasn't around many people. Everyone was more up towards the front which was actually preferable because I don't think I want anyone to overhear this insanity I've been dealing with. I carefully tread over to her, not really having much thought on what to say, but I figured it was worth a try anyway. I find myself right next to her and can barely get my lips to move until, if you want to talk to me, Take out your phone and pretend you're calling someone. It's safer that way. She could tell I was looking for her. Normally, I would think that's a ridiculous idea. But given the situation and everything I've seen so far, I felt it better to just play ball. 
So I followed through and reached into my pocket for my phone. I even pretended to punch in some numbers to make it look real. The 7 train normally goes above ground after a bit, so I had to wait to get service first. Soon, we were both looking out the window at a pale and overcast sky, hearing the rain as it pattered against the window. After I held it up to my face for a few seconds, I took a deep breath and asked the first question that came to mind. Are, are you okay? Are you hurt? Her gaze shifted to me. Finally, she seemed a bit thrown off by what I said. After what you saw? That's really your first question? Yes, that thing didn't hurt you, did it? She let out a small chuckle. <laughs> Don't worry, I'm fine. Thanks for asking, I'm actually more worried about you. I nodded in agreement. I was pretty worried for myself too. So, who are you? And what's with you and this train and that monster? I've, nev I've never seen anything like it. Her face tensed up. You really want to know? I looked directly into her green eyes. I wouldn't have come back if I didn't. Hmm. I guess I owe you that much, at least. Okay, um, to answer your questions in order, I'm Zoe. That's all I can remember. No last name, no memories, nobody looking for me. Just Zoe. That's all I have. As for the train, I can't leave, literally, like I physically can't leave. The furthest thing I can remember was walking up here. I tried to talk to a random person to figure out where I was, but no answer, like I wasn't even there. At first, I thought he was just being rude, just another jerk in the city. That was until I tried talking to another person and then another, and another, and another, and so on. Then I tried to leave the train, emphasis on tried. I got as far as the door and I watched it open, but I couldn't even get my hand out, much less my body. It was like a force field, or like a gravitational pull sucking me back in. I was terrified, and I had nobody to help me. I tried waving my hands in people's faces, jumping around, yelling and screaming and crying. But it eventually clicked that nobody could see or hear me. I tried all day, though, but nothing. All I could do was just watch outside this stupid window. I don't even know how long it's been. Could be months, years. I seriously have no clue. As for that creature you saw, he was one of the first to actually see me. I was crying for so long, stuck in this reality of my life, until I heard his voice. He only said one thing to me. We're all dead. Better get used to it. Then he disappeared into the darkness, humming a weird tune. We call him the Thin Man. He doesn't talk much, not to mention he appears very rarely and he only transforms into that when he senses a corporeal. Sorry, a what? Oh, right. You don't know this stuff. A corporeal, that's what we call the living who can see us. Wasn't my choice for a name, but somehow it stuck. Wait, wait, hold on. You said we? There's more of you guys stuck here on the train? Like ghosts or spirits or something? Zoe nodded. Yeah, quite a few of us. I mean, we kind of just assume we're dead. What other explanation could there be? And now that you see us, we can all see you. We all know you're here. Is that a bad thing? 
If you're thinking about whether or not we can turn into that nightmare, don't worry. He's the only one who's proven to do it. My guess is that he did some things in life that twisted his soul into something horrific, and now he takes pride in his new life. Okay, wow, um, that's a lot to take in. Zoe paused and thought for a second. You said your name was Isaac, right? I nodded as I adjusted my phone to my other ear in a more comfortable position. I am surprised she remembered my name. What with all that happened in that small moment? Well, it was a nice meeting you, Isaac. I'll be honest. If I've only heard of corporeals, but you're the first one to ever approach me. I've also heard of them being taken. You're lucky to be alive, if I'm being honest. I didn't think you'd come back at all. Figured the thin man would have scared the crap out of you. Well, he definitely did. But it's okay. I was feeling pretty constipated these past few weeks, so I definitely needed that. Zoe laughed at my slightly childish joke, and it wasn't just a warm smile or even a chuckle. It was a genuine laugh, like it was something she hadn't got to experience in years. You know, it's been a while since I've talked with someone like this, like everything is normal. This was nice. She leaned back against the window. Now, if you'll excuse me, I probably should get back to, well, you know. She gestured towards the window, seeming somewhat content with her eternity on this train. I thought for a second, wait, maybe I can help you. Zoe focused back on me. Help me? How? Did I not mention stuck on this train or... I mean, if you're really a spirit stuck on this train, maybe you have some unfinished business. Unfinished business? Yeah, I mean, most ghosts in books and movies and stuff that are stuck in one place are usually stuck because of something that still needs to be done or discovered. If we figure it out, then maybe you can move on from this train and get on with the rest of your afterlife. Zoe seemed like a really nice girl. I figured it would be unfair for someone like her to be stuck in this plane of existence, forced to forever be bound to this cycle. She may not have any family, friends, or anyone at all who can help her, but she has me. Hmm. Okay. But on one condition, you gotta get on this route at least once a day and talk to me about anything to at least keep me sane. Okay, sure. No problem. I mean it. Promise me. Promise. Okay. I believe you. Meet me here tomorrow night at 10. There's less people around that time. I'll introduce you to the family. Who exactly is the family? You'll have to meet me to find out. As the train came to a stop, I said my byes to Zoe. My mission clear. I may have been biased because I did really like her, but it's more than that. I was going to help her, whatever it takes. Apparently, I've had this gift to see people on a whole different ex existential plane, and it makes me wonder how many more have I unknowingly seen. They may have been shopping at the store, going for morning runs, playing at the playground. What other souls were stuck in the same spot, doing the same thing forever? Finishing those thoughts, the doors slid open, greeting me with a swift breeze and pink and blue gradient sky. I only managed to take a few steps before I froze completely. My breath was visible again. I had goosebumps, like my skin was freezing. I heard a familiar humming. On the bench, a few feet in front of me was that nightmare I was hoping to never see again. The same skinny, lanky man 
looking down to where I couldn't see his face, but I knew it was him. He was sitting there waiting for me. It was the thin man.